Okay, so this is a video about David Bedell's Channel 4 documentary entitled Jews Don't Count. I'm doing this video because even though there's quite a lot of things I think are really good about it, which have been written by commentators on the left, some of which I'll talk about, I think there's some things which are still not being said, so I kind of wanted to have a go at entering the debate. Also, um, making this because Claudia Berlin offered to edit it for me, and I hate editing, so thank you, Claudia. Some people on Twitter, when I've um, been talking about the documentary, have said we shouldn't be giving David Baddiel attention. I think we've gone way past that. David Baddiel has got the attention. His argument has got the attention. His argument is that the main source of anti-Semitism in contemporary society is, is the left. He doesn't call it the left, he calls it progressives, we'll come on to that. And it's not just David Baddiel. This is a documentary on Channel 4, so a lot of people have signed off on it, um, including people who have a history with the left, like Louis Theroux, who executive produced this documentary. We have a play that's been on this year um, at the Royal Court called Jews in Their Own Words by Jonathan Friedland. And we have a kind of huge um, dominance of discussion of anti-Semitism um, in news media over um, since 2017, really, in this country. So it's not just the deal. We need to talk about it. We need to confront these, these arguments. So what is his argument? So his argument is that negative stereotypes of Jews persist because, and I'm quoting here, Jews don't count as a proper minority in the conversation about racism and discrimination. So there's a lot of things going on here. First of all, why does he think negative stereotypes of other groups um, continue? Why are there still negative stereotypes about black people, about Muslims and about other groups if they do count within um, conversations about race and discrimination? The other thing is, it's a question of what conversations about race and discrimination he's interested in, and, and he's very much interested in those which happen on the left rather than the right. So, for example, in the documentary, he says, the responsibility for that lies with people who believe in inclusivity. And we cut straight from that to Don Butler giving a speech at Labour Party conference. So the idea is that in progressive circles, which, as I said, he does not define, but he clearly links the Labour Party through um, editing techniques like the one I outlined. Um, and this is the same as is true of Jonathan Friedland's play at the Royal Court. And the same as is true of the kind of dominant um, narrative that we're speaking about, which isn't just David Baddiel, but is in the news media as well. The idea is that in progressive circles, anti-Semitism is treated differently than other racisms. It's not acknowledged, it's not taken seriously. And implicitly, the argument is this should be our main focus in fighting anti-Semitism. So I'm going to take apart that argument. Other people have done it, but I think it's useful to do that. But I'm also going to try and go bigger than that. So Michael Walker on Navarra Media, where they did um, a segment on, on this documentary, said to justify talking about it, it's become an incredibly dominant narrative. This idea, um, the one that I outlined, has somehow embarrassingly become completely hegemonic in British political discourse. And Michael continues, I think it's bizarre. It's embarrassing, frankly. So I think what's important to say is, first of all, that this ignores Michael Walker specifically and Navarra Media generally having a role in this idea that the main source of anti-Semitism in contemporary society is progressives, having a role in making that happen, in making that dominant. And I've done a video with, um, a couple of videos with um, Daniel Taylor for his channel, Complaints on the Plate, which I'll put links to in the description below this video, which really focus on this. But Navarra Media um, specifically um, went along with the idea that there was a significant problem with anti-Semitism in the Labour Party to different levels and in different ways, and link this to conspiracy theories, and Michael specifically did videos about this. Um, so it, it definitely ignores their role. But it's second, and perhaps this, I'm sure this is connected, it treats that process as just kind of embarrassing and bizarre, but not something where you can ask questions about. And I think that's really what's missing in the discussions about this program is that we're not really talking about what this dominant narrative is, why it's useful at this particular political moment to be talking about anti-Semitism in this way, and whose interests are served by it. So let's get the other critiques out of the way before I come on to talk about that, because they are really important, um, but they have been dealt with. So first of all, a critique of David Baddiel as the person to present this documentary. Um, so David Baddiel has a long um, and very public history of racism 
Um, he's made a lot of racist comments um, about the black community, about the um, Gypsy Roma Traveller community, but he's most well known for um, him and Frank Skinner on Fantasy Football League for racist caricatures and bullying and abuse of footballer Jason Lee. As part of this documentary, he has um, gives an apology to Jason Lee. Um, as Claudia Boleyn says in her kind of really interesting take on this, it wasn't an apology that centred Jason Lee. It was an apology that centred David Baddiel and his victimhood. Um, and very much this whole documentary centres David Baddiel and his victimhood. But it's not just in the past. David Baddiel's racism. Claudia Boleyn points out that he uses Dawn Butler and also Whoopi Goldberg as the two individual examples of his um, thesis in the documentary of his argument. And it's interesting that it's just two black women that he chooses to put in those roles, as Claudia points out. And it's clearly a choice by him. He may not be one he's aware of, but it's a choice that's very telling about who he is and where he's coming from. And when he's having a longer conversation with Jason Lee, which I think is really worth watching, an hour long conversation, which is very much um, a very tiny excerpt in the, the documentary, but airs on Channel 4. He also gives the example of the black leader, Malcolm X, as someone who is anti-Semitic. So again, it's a question of who he's choosing and why, and how this um, damages his message, really. And another thing which does, um, in the discussion with Jason Lee, Jason Lee is very insistent on asking, do you understand what it means to do the work in this field? Do you understand what allyship means? Um, and Jason Lee gives examples of him doing the work on his allyship, um, including his current support for women's football. And David's response to this is, well, I'm focusing on anti-Semitism. I think his inability to really understand what it means to do the work, to, um, to be an ally, really discredits him. But irregardless, if, even if he wasn't doing this documentary, someone else would be, and other people are. So let's go on to acknowledge that it's gaslighting to many to turn him into an expert on racism, not just to Jason Lee, but to um, the black people who were abused and whose children were abused at school because of, of what David Bill and Frank Skinner did on fantasy football. But like I said, we need to move on and talk about why now? Why this argument? Why has he become this spokesperson? Given how, what a terrible record he has, given how discredited he has, why is he so lauded by the media? And it is because of what he's saying. So let's look at what he's saying. So also on Navarra Media, Ash Sarkar has talked about how David Baddiel's very career, the fact that he was not damaged by his public record of racism, shows that his argument is wrong, shows that other racisms are not taken more seriously than anti-Semitism. And Ash Sarkar talks about other examples. Um, she mentions Boris Johnson, his Islamophobia, his racism. She mentions anti-immigrant feeling. Now, it, it says don't invalidate David Baddiel's argument because his argument is not about the right, it's about the left. But she also mentions the huge evidence that we have, um, for example, in the Al Jazeera documentary, Labour Files, but also in Martin Ford's report, which I think is, um, I have lots of problems with, but I think has done an amazing job, and a really important job of, of exposing how much Islamophobia there is in the Labour Party, how much anti-black racism there is. And it really shows uh, David Dill's argument has no credibility at all. And I'd add to that a couple of examples. So one is it took David Dill 25 years to apologise to Jason Lee. And he did it, as, as I said, in a way that's very, very self-serving in order to serve his own agenda, to promote his own narratives and his own victimhood. That compares radically with one of the examples that David Deal goes into in great detail in his show, which is the Royal Court putting on a play with a grossly anti-Semitic character in it, a stereotypical character, um, and saying that they could not admit this was anti-Semitism, they could not apologise for it. And he admits at the end they did. Actually, it took them months, not years, to apologise. And part of that apology was to put on a play which pushes the same narrative as David Baddiel's book, the play Jews in, in, in their own words. So even that example, that difference between the 25 years that it took David Baddiel, the fact that it did him no damage to his career, and the Royal Court, where it took them less than a year to apologise and where it did huge damage to their reputation, 
Um, that shows that his argument is blatantly wrong. And I'm going to use an example which is about Israel-Palestine because I think it's important to get that into debate. And I'll, get, I'll talk more about that later. And David Baddiel brings Israel into the debate, and we'll talk about how he does that later. But first of all, I want to talk about something else that happened last week. In just a couple of days after this documentary aired, I think it was, Rachel Reeves, who's Labour's shadow chancellor, attended the Labour Friends of Israel lunch. This is an annual event. She gave the keynote address. She said there, Labour would never tolerate the downplaying of anti-Semitism, and to quote her, which is why Jeremy Corbyn is not in the parliamentary party. Also in attendance at this dinner was Zippy Otaveli. She is a far-right Zionist. She has called Palestinians thieves of history. She invited fascists into the Israeli parliament. She called the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in 1948 the Nakba, an Arab lie. She demanded Palestinian homes in the West Bank be destroyed to make way for Israeli settlements. She campaigned for the annexation of the West Bank, and she has said there is no Palestinian people. This woman was in the room when Rachel Reeves completely ignored her racism, did not feel the need to call it out in any way whatsoever, was implicitly supporting it by being there. And yet she thinks that the manner in which Jeremy Corbyn did or did not apologise after the EHRC report is the big issue that she needs to speak about in terms of racism. There's a reason why people have a phrase progressive except for Palestine. If there is any oppressed group whose oppression is not taken seriously by our society and, and by our world it is that of the Palestinian people. Okay, so the next criticism of his argument that we can make is, um, and Emily Hilton makes this in New Statesman, so I'll quote from her on it, um, is that his argument is that progressives set Jews apart, but actually what he does is provide a kind of argument that sets Jews apart. And so to quote Emily, the problem with the idea that Jews don't count is it offers no solutions, no way of moving forward. It separates Jews from the conversation rather than integrating us within it as partners with a shared desire for safety, freedom and justice. Where does that leave us? In the arms of the right. And we'll come back to that. Where does that leave us? OK, so crucial to it leaving us in the arms of the right is a um, rhetorical move that the documentary does which is to flatten experiences of racism. Um, and Rivka Brown points this out in her article on Navarra Media. So she talks about um, one of the more very interesting interactions that happens in the documentary where David Dill is talking to. She's not identified a thing in the documentary. I didn't know who she is. Um, but um, Rivka says it's Diona Badil, so his niece. And she's mixed heritage. Her mum's black and her dad is white Jewish. And she speaks about how she has to be more worried about her mum if she's driving, being stopped by a police car than her dad, because her mum is black. And David briefly acknowledges that, but then he moves on and he talks about um, how some Jewish people who changed their names are now being outed um, on the internet as having done so, and claims that as um, a, an equivalent experience to the fear that Diona feels about what the police could do to her black mum. Yeah, I'm not even going to comment on that. And the most dramatic case of flattening that happens in this documentary, um, which isn't that one even, is is when um, David Bill talks about um, a shooting in synagogue and says that it's really not the shooting per se that is the problem, but the fact that it is not acknowledged as an anti-Semitic incident, that that was not taken seriously as such. Now, what that does, of course, is flatten the idea of uh, acknowledging someone's pain, which is obviously important, but it flattens that and states it as equivalent to very violent, deadly um, forms of anti-Semitism. So what that does, of course, is push towards um, a narrative in which the left is a problem. And I want to talk about that at the end of this video. But what I want to do now is to talk about Israel. OK, we kind of have to talk about Israel in any discussion about anti-Semitism. We'll come on to that. But we also have to talk about Israel because David Badil talks about Israel. So what David Badil says is that he has, that Jews have no collective responsibility for Israel um, and that I'm not that bothered about Israel. So he claims a position of apathy on Israel. He also says Israel has done many bad things. And the way in which he really 
puts the other position as he gets Miriam Margulies on. So Miriam Margulies says, he's a little bit confused what she says. I don't know whether that's because it was confused in the interview with her or whether it was confused in how it was edited. But for what it's worth, she says that Israel is at the root of this, that Israel has opened Pandora's box. And she says that if you're connected to Israel, then it is your responsibility to speak about it. And when David says he feels no connection, she says it's willful of you to deny connection. I think she's spot on that. It's willful of him to deny connection. So Rivka Brown in, in her article on Navarra is quite good at bringing this issue in, which not many people have. Um, she talks about um, organisations like the Anti-Defamation -Defam League in the US, the Community Security Trust in the UK, who are the bodies who monitor anti-Semitism, um, and they use dodgy methodologies. But again, this flattening out happens that equalise online harassment and violent attacks, and as a consequence, churn out misleading research that produces such bizarre claims as that anti-Semitism is at an all-time high. Um, it's always at an all-time high. This is um, something which Tony Lerman has, has spoken about and written about in his, his work. Um, needless to say, such claims and the inflated statistics on which they're based make it harder, not easier, to get others to take our oppression, anti-Semitism, seriously. Not to mention leaving Jewish people in a state of perpetual immobilising anxiety. That said, it's easy to see the political uses of such inflammatory data collection, not least for a state that requires Jews' sense of impairment to justify occupation, blockade and apartheid. Indeed. So as Claudia Berlin in her video points out, what David Badil is doing, regardless of his much rehearsed not caring about Israel, is defending Israel. If you say the words, Israel has done many bad things, first of all, you position those bad things in the past, had done, not is doing. And second, you make huge violence equivalent to, you know, maybe being rude to someone. We all do bad things, right? I do bad things every day. Everyone does bad things, right? This is not a question of bad things. This is a question of structural racism. This is a question of apartheid. This is a question of ethnic cleansing. This is a question of a permanent, de facto permanent occupation. Um, it's very, very violent, where people are living under military rule for decade after decade after decade after decade. And every day we see that violence, we see that ethnic cleansing going on, we see that apartheid. So what David Dill is doing is defending Israel despite his protestations. And I want to talk a little bit about what he says about Zionism in his book. I haven't read his book. I don't think I can bear to read his book. And part of the reason I can't bear to is because of some of the excerpts which circulated on social media around the time it's publication. And this is one of them. So I'm quoting David Badil here. I think, by the way, that a lot of Jews on the left are ashamed of Israel. And so they go out of their way to say so. Fine. I'm not suggesting the state of Israel hasn't done many things to be ashamed of. But here's the thing. I am not responsible for those actions. And expecting that I should feel so is racist. If a non-Israeli Jew does feel responsible, for, it is internalised racism. To be perfectly honest, I think a fair amount of Jews and left are just ashamed of being Jewish. I think Jews and left have to some extent absorbed the myths about Jews being rich, capitalist power mongers, and so therefore make a special point of how un-Jewish they are. That's really horrible to read. So why, when Jewish people... Um, express solidarity with Palestinian people. Why isn't that allyship? Why isn't that anti-racism? Why is that self-hate? Um, this is not about us holding other Jews responsible individually or even holding ourselves responsible individually for anything that Israel does. But it is about taking responsibility for the fact that Israel, to some extent, acts in our name, that Jewish identity is in current world, very much tied to Israel, that I can, if I want, go to Israel and become a citizen overnight because I'm Jewish, um, that I can get housing there and treated well there in a way that Palestinians who've lived there all their lives, lived there for generations, cannot. And in taking responsibility for the things that come in our bodies, which claim to represent me as a UK Jewish person, say about Israel and about Palestine. And that's not self-hating, that's um, not shame. Okay. But beyond this, even if David Deal had not mentioned Israel, we would need to talk about Israel. 
and that is because there has been a systematic attempt to redefine anti-Semitism. In fact, not even an attempt, it's been successful, it has happened, right? We now have a situation in which, um, not in this documentary, albeit not in this documentary, but in the majority of contexts in which we see anti-Semitism um, discussed, the Israel is seen as the main target of contemporary anti-Semitism. So not individual Jews, not Jewish institutions, not Jewish communities, but Israel as symbolically acting as the collective Jew among nations. This has been called the new anti-Semitism. I was lucky enough to have a conversation with an expert on this, Tony Lerman, um, which I'll put a link to that video. If you want to get the kind of full detail on how that process has happened, how that shift in definition has happened and what the consequences are. So what you end up with, with this definition, is that Amnesty International are anti-Semitic. Human Rights Watch are anti-Semitic. Um, Palestinian human rights organisations become terrorist, essentially, within this definition. Um, the United Nations, the International Criminal Court, all of these are anti-Semitic. Um, and this, well, it goes to such an extent that human rights in general and international law in general are anti-Semitic within this definition. So what happens is that this really radically undermines attempts to take anti-Semitism seriously. And, and David Deal should be looking at this. It's not whether or not some person on Twitter who's on the left takes anti-Semitism seriously. It's a systematic undermining of our understanding of anti-Semitism in a way that confuses people, muddies the water, creates resistance in people for sure, because people don't understand how and what anti-Semitism is because we can't have a serious conversation about it. And because they see people who they know are not anti-Semitic, being condemned as anti-Semitic for things they know aren't anti-Semitic. Although I have to say that I have not found anyone better at dealing with and taking seriously anti-Semitism than the people I work with in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. So even in the case where people are getting accused every day of anti-Semitism for reasons they shouldn't, it is incredibly taken seriously in a way that I don't see in other um, any other part of society, actually. So... Even on that level, his argument is total nonsense. This is a very, very dangerous thing to conflate anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism, which David is part of doing here and is doing much more strongly in his book, as we saw. It's dangerous to Jewish people for the reasons I've said, and it is racist. It's racist because it shuts down discussion of Israeli apartheid. And that has disproportionate impact on people that are Palestinian. It also has disproportionate impact on people of colour more generally. We can see how it's been used to attack the Black Lives Matter movement, for example. So none of what I've said, of course, makes individual Jews responsible for Israeli actions, but it does make Israel part of understanding Jewish identity and anti-Semitism. There, I will leave my discussion about Israel, and I will come on to discussion about um, the political push of this documentary, which is very much about um, joining in what is a huge society-wide attack on the left, which has been going on throughout Jeremy Corbyn's leadership and intensified after the 2017 general election. On a scale, yes, there have been attacks on the left, always, um, in different ways. The left is not taken seriously. The left is not platformed in the way that the right is. Um, but this is a different level of attack that I've not experienced in, in my um, life before, and I'm in my 50s. And I want to talk about the role that this discussion plays. And I want to draw on a really brilliant um, article by Liz Fiketa, who's from the Institute for Race Relations, which again, I'll link to. And she wrote this in the aftermath of the publication of the EHRC report on Labour Party anti-Semitism. And she asked why this focus for the EHRC? Why did they do this? Um, and she links it to other things that the EHRC is doing to other things on their agenda and to what a broader agenda this serves. So she talks about them, for example, supporting Tony Thor's report on racism and how that downplayed structural racism and in fact spoke about colonialism as something that's positive, including positive for black British people. And also she speaks about and links it to the EHRC's support for the free speech, if you like, of um, people who hold gender critical views, I use that inverted commas, so people who are speaking in opposition to trans rights. So when she speaks 
um, about the HRC's support for people who push um, views against trans rights, um, although obviously they're not so concerned about um, people in the Labour Party having the right to speak um, in opposition to Zionism. She says that equality's laws do hold out that um, beliefs can be protected if they're compatible with human dignity and not in conflict with fundamental rights. But this specific intervention um, could open the door for philosophical belief to be elevated over the protection of the rights and dignity of minority groups. So this move by the HRC has the potential to set a new norm, I'm quoting her, in relation to the dilution of legal protections, not just for trans people, but for other minorities. Um, and she says that this fits with the government's agenda. So Liz Truss at that time was the minister in charge of equalities for the government. She obviously since then was briefly our prime minister. And Liz Fiketa writes that Liz Truss has made no secret of hostility to the very concept of protected characteristics, um, of race, of gender, of sexuality, of disability, and so on. And for her, equality should be geared towards providing more choice and opportunities for individuals and promoting a diversity of ideas rather than protecting minority communities. This is kind of a neoliberal, marketized version of um, equalities with um, diverse groups and interests competing with each other for attention and for rights. You can really see this agenda when you look at the two um, investigations the HRC did on the basis of public concern. Obviously, public concern is a problematic idea. I mean, whose concern are we talking about? Who is the public who are concerned about particular issues? It's very, um, as Liz points out, very, very open to manipulation by the media. And she says there were only two concern-driven investigations conducted by the EHRC between 2010 and 2018. One of those was the one about Labour anti-Semitism. The other was about the Home Office handling of Windrush. So I'm going to quote her at length. Compare EHRC concern over anti-Semitism amongst members of the Labour Party to its timidity in the deployment of its enforcement powers of institutional racism in the Home Office and the Windrush scandal. Compare the promptness of one investigation to the dilly-dallying on the other. Compare the fact that one was a full Section 20 investigation under the Equality Act of 2006 to the other, far more limited, public sector equality duty assessment. The Home Office's policies towards the Windrush generation resulted in at least 180 people being wrongfully deported, at least 11 of whom died before November 2018, at least nine more after applying to the scheme but before receiving any compensation, and countless others made homeless, countless others excluded from benefits. It was, in Sivanandan's important distinction, not so much about the racism that discriminates, as a racism that kills. And yet, when the HRC produced this report, even though it had the power to serve a compliance notice enforceable by the High Court requiring action, it did not do so, merely recommending the Home Office agree an action plan. So here we see that flattening in action. People dying, people being deported, people being killed, people being made homeless. These things are equivalent to people not getting their complaint about something they've seen on Twitter being dealt with as rapidly as they want it to be dealt with, even though it's dealt with more rapidly than complaints of anti-black racism and complaints of Islamophobia, as we know. These are the same things. And this is serving a far-right agenda that is attempting to completely dismantle the equalities legislation, the equalities framework that we have in this country, and to completely destroy the left, um, to use it as a way of undermining the movement on the left that grew up around Jeremy Corbyn in this country, the movement in solidarity with Palestinians, the broader um, anti-imperialist left, of whom both of those are our parts, and to discredit us and our policies and undermine and demoralise us. This is why we have the David Bedil documentary, not because he's a great guy, not because um, his arguments make any sense, they make no sense at all, but because they serve a broader agenda. And it's that broad agenda we need to really, really talk about. Um, so thanks for listening. I hope you found something of use in this. I'd really appreciate if you um, leave comments. I'm really interested in discussion. Um, I will try and re reply to those comments and also to anything that you say around this on, on Twitter.